I couldn't do what they hired me to do is to teach philosophy. All you would need is a few students to make your life hell. And, you know, your colleagues already buy into the ideology and they have a vested interest in making sure that the ideology is promulgated throughout the institution. And if you don't adhere to those values, it's not like you're merely wrong. It's that you're a bad person. Hello and welcome to Marshall Matters with me, Winston Marshall for The Spectator. Today it is my privilege to speak to professor, philosopher, author, former professor at Portland State University till a rather dramatic resignation in September 2021, Peter Boghosian. Peter, thank you so much for thank speaking you. with me Appreciate today. Thank you. Appreciate having me on and getting to know you over the last few days. Been yeah, very, we've had some fun. Very cool. If you wouldn't mind, maybe for listeners who aren't familiar with your story. Yeah. Maybe you can tell us why you uh, resigned from Portland State University. Sure. So I did my dissertation in the prisons with prison inmates, and it was using the Socratic method, which is a way of asking people questions to help the men. And I say men because everyone in my study at the time, the prison was Columbia River Correctional Institution. It was all male to help the men desist from crime so that they had tools that they could use. So then I took the tools that I developed from my dissertation and then I, as you mentioned, the book, I, I turned the same Socratic questioning tools to uh, issues of religious fundamentalism and is issues of faith specifically. And then I, you, you know, I came up with an app to teach people how to have civil conversations. That's the key in this whole thing, civil conversations across divides. And, and a book. And, and a book, how, how to, to have impossible conversations mm -hmm. about the, the same thing, how to teach people how to have civil conversations. And now I, I, with Reed and I, we go around the world and we do this thing called spectrum street epistemology. Mm -hmm. And epistemology is how you know what you think you know. And we give people tools as part of my nonprofit. Uh, we help them calibrate their beliefs to the evidence they have. Okay, so that's a little background. 2017, um, well, I first noticed a kind of uh, sickness in the academy in around 2012, 2013. The more I investigated, the more I was convinced it was from corrupt bodies of scholarship, peer-reviewed literature. My, my uh, writing partner and I, James Lindsay, also co-authored the book with me. We published our first uh, uh, Sokol-style hoax paper, which is basically to see what you can get the most you can get in a journal. And we published a paper called The Conceptual Penis as a Social Construct, in which we, it's a very funny pa paper, by the way. I, I think it's very funny, uh, in which we claim that, among other things, penises were responsible for climate change. And the paper got in, and there, were a, there was a lot of criticism of the paper. You didn't do this. You should have done this. Uh, you need more journals, higher ranking journals. And so I said to Jim, okay, they've given us a roadmap. Let's follow that. And then we. So they assumed it was serious. And. Well, yeah, they published it as yeah. a serious pair. Like they thought this was a, it got past peer review. But our critics said, well, you didn't, you need to submit that to journals in gender studies. You, cause, cause I was convinced at the time that the ideological rot, the corruption was coming from very specific disciplines and fields, Spe fields that didn't try to falsify hypotheses, but tried to forward narratives. So we, published or we we wrote with helen pluckrose also well, what, wait sorry what yeah. type of narrative what, what kind of fields do you mean is that the grievance fields is that yeah what you're referring to? So fields that forward grievances or that there's just there's racism baked into the system systemic post -colonial racism theory, this is post-colonial theory basically uh, post-modernism and, and all its uh children. helen pluckrose ca calls it applied postmodernism. so almost anything with the word studies in it the, the purpose of those disciplines isn't to do what we, one would think that one does in science, which is to figure out what's true, test hypotheses, use the best, most rigorous methods available. But the purpose is to forward very specific conclusions about the world and get those conclusions implemented and adopted to change public policies. And mm. there's so activism, essentially. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's even worse than activism because it's not predicated upon something that's true. It's predicated on complete nonsense. How do you think they got into the university, those, those uh, different uh, studies? Uh, how did my, our papers get no, in? Those, so those disciplines? Rewinding a little bit. Is yeah. this, do we go back to the Frankfurt School? Do we go, how does this leak into the American Academy? 
Oh boy, that's a long conversation. Um, it, it okay. So I'll give you the the spark notes or the cliff notes 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 version of it. So, uh, as a general rule, people like people who are like themselves. People hire people in an academy who have similar ideological dispositions, similar positions about issues, similar stances. And so, I mean, you can see that. At, just rang through my mind. You can see that, for example, in psychology, when behaviorism is in, behaviorists would hire other behaviorists because they think it's true. So let's talk about idea laundering for a moment. This is a key concept. Idea laundering. Idea laundering, like money laundering. Uh -huh. Money goes in, dirty money goes in, corrupt money goes in. And they, they call it laundering because it used to be in New York with all the laundry machines. And then it goes out laundered and in that it looks it's all good for the taxes so you could spend it right so you can write write checks for apartments or what have you the same thing is operative in uh, an ideological sense or stance with peer-reviewed studies and peer-reviewed journals people have a moral impulse a bunch of people get together who have a similar moral impulse they start a journal people publish people also with that moral impulse publish in those journals these are not true. They're not facts. They're not anything. They're just musings, usually of ideologues. People have this idea. They publish it, and it comes out as a peer-reviewed journal. The more of those you get published, as a general rule, it's seven papers in seven years, and you get tenure. So what happens is that that when you publish in, in specific journals and specific fields, and it was out of the STEM fields. Now it's increasingly within the STEM fields, you're more likely to get tenure. When you're more likely to get tenure, you hire other people who have similar beliefs. So it's, in, it's called a promotion and tenure basket. So you publish an article in a grievance studies field in a journal, which is already corrupt to begin with, but it looks on paper as if you're publishing and making a contribution to the literature. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So if, so slowly the academy was, that's one explanation. There are multiple explanations. That's why it's, I, I pause to think it's a very complicated problem. It, the other, we, we could literally do a whole podcast on this. The other problem is that educational administrators were hired universally who have ed school degrees. We did a series on this with Lyle, Lyle Asher's Why Are Colleges Becoming Cults? And the ideas that are forwarded are certain ideas that are inherent in critical race theory without using the words critical race theory. So oppressive systemic power imbalances, oppressive structures. We need Heather McDonald just has a new book about that from the Manhattan Institute. Um, but th th this is a problem that has consumed the academy. And the question, the question now is how do we get out of it? Because virtually nobody disagrees that this is a problem. Anybody who would look at the, at the, we could look at it from cancellations. We could look at it from. Yeah, sorry, you got to. Go ahead. Well, no, and it seems like your career is that you you were caught in the crossfires where those ideas were brewing for a long time and stewing for a long time, and then and you and you started to question those. And but you say no one would disagree that those are a problem. Yeah. And one of the things I'm trying to work out is 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 this coming from the students? Or is it coming from the the teachers, the professors, and 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 because if if no one agrees, it's if everyone agrees, it's a problem. Yeah. Then surely we wouldn't be in a situation where you had to quit. Yeah. I, okay. So so n n what I meant by nobody, I, sh I should have articulated myself. Nobody who's independent, who looks at the problem independently, would say, "Wow, there's no problem here. Move along." Mm -hmm. And anybody who questions. I mean, even ask the question, you know, where, where's the evidence for this? I was constantly accused of microaggressions. Asking for evidence became a microaggression. Um, if, 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 if you have a belief, if you want to institute a policy for whatever the policy is, that students need safe spaces or the trigger warning should be on syllabi, these are just in an academic context. If somebody says to you, okay, so you think we should do this institutionally, what is the data for this? Mm -hmm. What is the data? So even if you pointed to a, a peer-reviewed journal that itself had been idea laundered, right? The, the, the discharging of the moral impulse by some ideologue, you should still be able to point to that. But the idea that this is somehow a universal truth, which is weird for people who don't believe in universal truths, but 
um, this is somehow a universal truth and everybody needs to adopt it and nobody is allowed to ask about any evidence for this. That alone, even if it's true that there, even if you, there were evidence for microaggressions, trigger warning, safe spaces, belonging, whatever it is, you should be able to provide that evidence. Mm -hmm. It, it seems ridiculous that that philosophy that or that means of operating could infiltrate the university. It's the antithesis of what one thinks the university is for. Yeah, so th to understand that, you have to understand how groups of smart people... So, so, and Michael Shermer writes about this in The Believing Brain, and I love this. I talk about it all the time. It's one of my favorite quotations. Um, why smart people believe weird things because they're better at reasoning to bad conclusions. Mm -hmm. So they're better at offering good reasons for bad conclusions. Groups of smart people are better still. So it's precisely because they were academics that they were better at writing to what was morally fashionable. So you have a bunch of people who are defending the dominant moral orthodoxy. Mm. Uh -huh. And then that's how that becomes institutionalized. That's how you get the wide scale adoption of that. They're not questioning, they're not, and, and, and there's a, a reward mechanism in place. You get a job for life. You know, you, you, you go up in the promotion ladder, uh -huh. et cetera. Can you explain to me peer review and how that operates? Because I learned this or heard this rather recently from uh, listening to Eric Weinstein and his scathing criticisms of, of peer reviews. And I'm not sure I totally correct. understood it because it's actually quite a new uh, peer review didn't exist. In, am I right until about 50 years ago? If I, a little more than that, but yeah. So, so the idea is that, so there's publishing, there are all kinds of publishing. There's publishing on Substack, which, you know, basically publishing on a blog. There's publishing a zine or a magazine. There's getting an article published, for example, in you know, the Atlantic or scientific American or what have you, which has gone woke, terribly woke. And then there's peer review. Peer review is a different animal. So peer review, you submit an article to an editor who runs a journal. And the journal will be like, you know, Journal of Fat Studies, which is one of our journals. <laughs> right. Which doesn't do what you think it does. The goal of fat studies is not to measure A1Cs or talk about, you know, carb carbs and protein. What is the goal of fat studies? The, the goal of fat studies is to advocate for fat acceptance and to claim that you, and that obese, to claim that obesity is a narrative pushed by the medical profession and you can be healthy at any size. That's the brief encapsulation of fat studies. That's actually studied in universities in America. Well, it's a, a journal, a peer review journal run by a woman named Charlotte Cooper out of your island there, the UK. So sorry. Yeah, I'm, I am <laughs> I am as well, who herself happens to be morbidly obese. Not necessarily that that e explains anything, but the uh, overwhelming preponderance, the, the overwhelming uh, number of proponents are females, the authors of these journals, and most of whom I've seen are morbidly obese. And so they don't like the word obese. So, every, so if you think of the world as everything being a narrative, a narrative is just a story. Mm. Everybody has their own narratives. Medicine has their narratives. You know, rappers have their, everybody, banjo players. I don't know anything about banjo, but- We have you know, a narrative. You have a narrative. Okay, so everybody has their own narrative. So um, the narrative of obesity- the word obesity itself captures a medical narrative. They don't want the word obesity used. They want the word fat used. Mm -hmm. So, Because it's less offensive to them. Um, no, because they believe that you can be healthy at any size. And if you say obesity, that's an inherently bad thing. Uh -huh. that's, a, that's, a, that's something that buys into a medical understanding of a physical phenomenon. So think about it like this. Nietzsche says that there are no there are no moral phenomenon, only moral interpretations of phenomenon. So being fat, so if I brought in a person who was like 400 pounds here and you affixed a word to that person, you know, fat, morbidly obese, whatever the word was, that would be a judgment on your part of the physical well, phenomenon. So I was going to say, fat is used just as much as an offensive term as obesity or as a negative term as obesity, uh, is it not? No, for them, obesity is the... It's it, more offensive. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not just offensive, but it's, it's, um, it's the ascription of a 
medical, again, narrative, a medical perception of the world onto a fat body. <laughs> okay. So, <laughs> it's pretty stupid. So back to peer review that's then. A, that's the other thing. Is this stuff is just so stupid. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it's just idiotic. And it's the proponents of it are almost exclusively have mediocre minds. It's just too stupid to sustain itself. It's just too idiotic. Okay. So you're rather pessimistic then about the state of the academy in, in this oh, country. Oh, it's completely like, pessimistic. But, but so peer reviewed. So, back to, so the idea is that, for example, in the journal Fat Studies, you get other people who have published in the journal, and so they become experts in the field. So somebody should be blind. In other words, the reviewer should know who it is. Look at the article, and the best people try to vet that article to see whether or not it should go into the journal based upon if it meets certain criteria for the journal, right? If is it scholarly rigorous, is it this? But in most of these journals, and I do use that word very specifically, it should be virtually all, but I'll just tone it down to say most. The idea is that you, you want certain conclusions to percolate into the broader culture. And the way that you do that is that you you have certain starting assumptions. So if you want to get a paper published, you write to those starting assumptions. There is systemic, the whole system is corrupt. There is, you know, racism everywhere. Whatever the whatever the starting assumption is, it doesn't have to be something within the suite of woke ideology. It could be, you know, something about barbers or what have you. But we don't we don't have those. It's only things that deal with identity level salience, specifically gender, race, sexual orientation, things of that nature. Okay, so is, uh, do you think it's fair then that the, the university is for me to think it's completely rotten? The, these ideas have completely taken over, yes. infiltrated everything. Correct. And that's presumably, you know, you describe in your resignation letter that you were even spat on yeah. when you were there. But actually, it seems perhaps that you left maybe because you'd just given up hope that the university functioned as it's supposed to function as a, a place for three, four, and inquir inquiry. Well, I, I couldn't do what they hired me to do was to teach philosophy. I was getting complaints constantly about everything when I challenged. A, you, you couldn't even present the other side of an issue. Now, that's not with every single student, but all you would need is a few students to make your life hell. And, you know, your colleagues already buy into the ideology and they have a vested interest in making sure that the ideology is promulgated throughout the institution mm -hmm. and the larger society. And if you don't adhere to those values, it's not like you're merely wrong. It's that you're a bad person. Mm -hmm. There's something endemically flawed with you and you need to go through some kind of re-education or you're just, you know, irredeemable. But you are now part of some what of an academic fight back with the University of Austin. Correct. We actually are in Austin now as we speak. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, can you tell me about University of Austin and why it's so important? It's a university predicated upon what traditional universities have always been, truth seeking. Um, it's run, it's president is Pano Canulis. Joe Lonsdale, the entrepreneur, is on the board of directors. Barry Weiss from the Free Press is on the board of directors. Um, faculty are Ayan Hersi Ali, Neil Ferguson from your island, a different part of your island, the historian. Um, uh, Kathleen Stock, also from your island. She's a very brave a lot, woman. A, a lot of, uh, she's an extremely brave woman. Uh, Similarly to you, forced to leave her university, being hounded by the trans ideologues. Correct. Yeah, yeah. Correct. Yeah. So that's another type of derangement that maybe we could go into a little bit. But so it's a, it's a university. We have the forbidden. I'm coming back in June for the forbidden classes. Kathleen Stock is going to be here as well mm -hmm. for the forbidden classes. Um, David Mamet, et cetera. It's really a fascinating group of people they've assembled, like genuinely interesting people. And the university is set to open in 2024 in Austin. The forbidden classes are in Dallas this summer. Okay. And you're going to be there, right? I am. I'll be there in June uh, doing, I think, a question and answers. So, thing. You, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm a believer in, in, in that uh, I, I, I've, I've noticed this stuff in academia the academy for for a, for a while, even though I, I didn't actually go to university, but uh, I um, I like the idea of building, I think we need to build new institutions. So I, I think that's the correct response. I, there's one which idea is that we need to change. And, and I kind of wanted to ask whether there's a new okay. generation of teachers and students going into 
the long existing universities who might be able to change, who rebel against these ideologies okay. that you've been discussing, or whether we need to build new institutions completely. And that, you know, I'm not sure which is right. Maybe it's both. Okay. So before I say that, I, I will make a prediction. Mm -hmm. You are going to love the students. I mean, amazing faculty students. The level of intellectual engagement that you'll find this summer is phenomenal. Like it, off the charts, crazy. <laughs> And what I particularly like with the students is just the hanging out. So, we, you know, we'd go to these classes and they'd come back and they just, I mean, it was very intense and they really are completely curious. Yeah. Okay. So now back to the institution. So there are two ways to look at the problem. One way is the way that I believe is that they're irredeemable and you have to build new things. The other way is Chris Rufo's way and he's with the Manhattan Institute. And he believes that reform is still possible once you kick out the DEI bureaucrats. So let's lay that terrain a little bit. Let's explain, let's explain that. So it is not possible, it is not possible to have both DEI and free speech. You either get DEI or you get free speech. Anything else so you have a simple choice. So anybody making a Chicago statement or this declaration, it's just not true. It's Harvard uh, put something up about that recently. They have a, it's never going to work. It's literally impossible because the whole mission of DEI is to limit what people say so they won't, so certain minorities won't be, won't feel, quote unquote, feel excluded. The whole, I, the whole premise of it is that the system is inherently racist. Um, everything from who gets into the institutions and universities, SAT scores, the whole, it's just not possible. So you have the Chris Rufo idea. Now, here's the interesting thing. So in 1945, Karl Popper, also from your island, Austrian English, uh, the philosopher of science, has a wonderful thing on the paradox of tolerance. And the paradox of tolerance is the idea that to what extent should the tolerant tolerate the intolerant? Mm -hmm. So on a taking it out of the academy. So for example, the Netherlands right now, or uh, actually London to, to, to an extent, but um, Sweden, to what extent should broadly liberal societies tolerate pockets of Islamic radicalism? Mm -hmm. People who are, you know, and, and those views about homosexuality, those views about covering of women, etc. And so what we have, so this is how I view the system. You have a, a group of people who participate in an ideology. That ideology has metastasized throughout the educational system. Not only do they control bureaucracies, but they have a direct path to the president. Usually there's a kind of hierarchical organization in which one files a complaint or what have you would have to go. But the DEI goes right to the top. They are offices searching for tasks with the assumption that sexism and racism already exist and bigotry and homophobia, rank bias of some sort, and we just need to figure out how it manifests. That's a tenet, that's an underlying principle of critical race theory. So to what extent do we tolerate the intolerant? And so Rufo is going after and he's being very effective. He's working with Ron DeSantis right now. And I hope he's successful. And the criticism of Rufo, I don't think, holds. The criticism is you're trying to do things that woke people are doing on the opposite end. So woke so people what, are limiting speech. What is Rufo speed. doing? Sorry. So Rufo is going in and eliminating DEI bureaucracy so we can have more of a classically liberal education. Okay. The problem is you just have to make sure that those aren't staffed by only people who have another ideology or similar ideology, right? So, so, so the criticism of Rufo then is that what he's doing is he's replacing one ideology with another. Mm. Okay. And, and that's certainly something to be mindful of, but the idea then that once these DEI bureaucrats are kicked out, and this is a, a very significant uh, uh, you know, in Stanford, for example, um, it's almost a two to one student ratio with uh, diversity bureaucrats. And these have, these are enormously um, f well funded departments and individual positions are very highly paid. So this is not a, a, a trivially, a financially trivial matter. So to what extent 
should we tolerate the intolerant when the very people, once they get kicked out from the DEI bureaucracy, they're screaming about free speech. The very people who are taking away everybody else's free speech. So I hope Rufo is successful. I don't know if he'll be, but I'm not going to wait and find out. I'm going to build new things. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make an institution. I'm going to help contribute to an institution that's based upon free speech and open inquiry and genuine curiosity where people who have questions can ask without fear of, you know, cancellation or being, you know, just a priori repudiated if something someone says. That's the interesting debate that we're having in Britain as well about and CRT in, in schools, not just in universities, but for those of us who believe in free speech, how do we how do we deal with CRT and you know the banning of it altogether? How do, do we get rid of it? If or, or how can we say we're for pro free speech if we don't somehow tolerate it? And maybe that's back to your, the tolerance paradox. But how how do how does one deal with that? Or okay. does that mean that you're not actually a free speech absolutist? Okay, so let's let's take a look at this because I think that's an excellent question. So let's. Let's linger on this and, and drill down it. So I'm going to give you some examples of ideologies. And, you, and so, so for, you know, phrenology, the bumps on the skull, the Nazis were big into that. And they believe it was predictive of intelligence and race and all this other silliness, which is simply not. It's, let's say that you had a group of people in a school system who wanted to institutionalize phrenology. And so they would give scholarships based upon people who had certain protuberances in their head. You, you, you had these people who uh, had classes in phrenology. They taught phrenology. It was um, throughout the curricula. Should we allow phrenology in the schools? And if you say, no, we don't want to allow phrenology in the schools, does that make you someone who's against free speech? Hmm. You don't have to answer that. I know I'm putting you on the spot. But let me give you another one. So bracket that. We can come back to that later. Let's say that we have, so phrenology is an idiotic ideology. Is it harmful? I don't know, maybe a little bit, but okay. Now let's, let's, let's. There's another way of taking it, right? Is that Nazism is an evil ideology. Yeah. That's where I was going next. Yeah. So one, and, and one needs to teach children about what happened and maybe it comes in a history class, right. you know, rather than a philosophy class. We don't teach Nazi philosophy, but we right. touch what this is. And maybe that's another way of, of dealing it. I guess the bigger problem with. CRT is it's not really so much it's certainly not a history although there's a history of the philosophy but it's a way of seeing the world and actually everything else is seen through those through correct prism so it's kind of like a whole other uh, problem right to, to okay so okay okay so let's let's go down that road so you have a few things going on we got the phrenology thing that we've bracketed now let's say that somebody wants to teach some pretty insidious stuff right so Nazi ideology, what have you. Let's just use that as the gold standard for bad, right? And if we attempt to kick those people out who want to institutionalize this and who are actually effectively institutionalizing this, does that mean we're against free speech? And what if they say, hey, you're trying to kick us out, you know, Zeke Heil, you know, you're just violating my rights to free speech. So, so, so you that's the that's the paradox of tolerance right that's the idea of to what extent should we leverage institutional mechanisms in the system and at this case of rufo and desantis we're talking at the state level right to kick out to change the board of trustees to then go out and extirpate the entire dei bureaucracy i would argue that you're not violating and I realize that many people are going to listen to this and say, oh, this is some kind of right wing. No, it's, it's not at all. You would do that with literally any other ideology. And just because the, the ideology happens to comport with your beliefs, it doesn't make it okay that it's institutionalized. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing is, why is an ideology? It's not falsifiable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's simply not falsifiable. At least phrenology is falsifiable. A couple of times through this conversation, you've used the word woke, yeah, which I think is a, a pejorative term, yeah. And uh, but very basic question because there seems to be uh, some de uh, debate about this or, or, or stumbling on this the definition of woke. What yeah. when you s use the term woke? Simple question, but what do you mean? I mean, it's actually very easy to understand. It's not even remotely complicated at all. It's that there are systemic injustices to people who, people who are woke. To people who are woke, you can never be woke enough. I did a one-minute series of videos where I explained words that woke people use in one minute. 
It means that you have a, an awareness of systemic injustice. It means that that injustice is somehow rooted in the system. And usually that almost always, but not always, that revolves around some kind of something with an identity level salience, race, um, gender, sexual orientation, trans status, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Isn't that, that seems like quite a, com a complex, because I've just, I've seen it as really just excessive progressivism. And yeah, I mean, that, so Is that look, too simple? Yeah, I mean, look, you, you, pe people have called it, Wesley Ann calls it the successor ideology. Uh, Majid Nawaz calls it regressive leftism. Helen Pluckrose calls it critical social justice. I usually use social justice, uppercase S, and just, it goes by different names. Mm -hmm. and, and they basically mean the same thing. Do you think in America, are we yet to have peak woke? Are we in the woke clash? Where, where do we think you, we sit now in, in the history of, of wokeism? Where, 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 where do you think we we've are? We've peaked. I think we've peaked, but the damage that it's done to the institutions is nowhere near over. Mm. Like? What, what, do you, what do you foresee? Well, I mean, the police force, I see the American cities, uh, um, the more woke cities, you know, the mayor of Portland, for example, is a public disgrace. Ted Wheeler, he, him. Uh, I, I see... <laughs> <laughs> I right that's just a kind of signaling right so he's he's more concerned about I mean he really should be concerned ex almost exclusively with rampant crime 300% increase in murders homelessness drug addiction f you know helping the people who who need help who are on the streets but instead he has a and it's not just Wheeler it's just this the strain of and and DAs aren't prosecuting crimes and it's it's a systemic breakdown, but I think that we are past peak woke, and I'll give you some pieces of evidence for that. Well, I tell, tell you one of the things, a few of the things that's changed. I think that the our brains are wired for testimony, and so the testimonies of detransitioners. I think it's some pretty ghastly stuff, and most, but not all, of those people are. Abigail Schreier writes about this in Irreversible Damage. These are basically young gay kids told that they're born in the wrong body and then they, they need to transition. I heard Katie Herzog say in an event once that she's she's gay and she said that there are no, her, her, her I think she termed it femme friends, said that there are no butch lesbians anymore. They've all transitioned. Wow. Okay. Actually, there's a, Hannah Barnes has written a book called yeah. um, Time to Think About it Travis what's happening Stark. in Britain. Uh, yeah. And, and, she shows it's it's something like of the female trans it's it's over eighty percent are gay and over and I think if the male trans is over ninety percent it's high again and very high autism. What did you say autism? Yeah. Um, and uh, and it's also it's changed over time. I think in the last fifteen years it was a majority a, a male phenomenon and now it's become a majority female phenomenon. But it, uh, so that that sort of it's it's changing and continues to change. I think. And it's by age group as well, which is mm. interesting. Deborah So and Colin Wright write about this. It's by certain age groups, younger people who are more susceptible to this. And in certain counties, you know, up to you know fifteen twenty percent uh, in California. I can't remember the name of the county. So you you, you have so Jason D Hill puts the the figure at 0.06% of the people are trans. And so anything other than that, you have to ask why. Is it that we're more lax and society doesn't care anymore? So people who are hiding it. But again, I just want to be crystal clear as I have to be in every one of these interviews. Anybody can lead any type of life they want. And if you want to be trans, you should absolutely knock yourself out and you should live a free life. Nobody should. That's absolutely inexcusable to harass someone or grief someone, et cetera. People should live any lives they want. I'm talking about something very different. I'm talking about a few things. Specifically, I'm talking about transitioning children before they're 18, mm -hmm. right? And and specifically hiding that from parents. My, my son wanted to dye his hair when he was 17. He needed a note from his parents. Um, you know, there's Luprin, the hormone, there's chest binding, there's... So I'm talking about a very specific thing. And then I'm also talking about um, trans women in sports. And I'm talking about trans women in prisons uh, or, or w women's only spaces more broadly. But specifically, I'm talking about uh, the detransitioners of young kids. And I think that's one of the things. It's not going to be the cancellations. It's not going to be. People realize fundamentally there's something ghastly about mutilating the genitals of children. 
Absolutely. If you see the photographs, I, I don't know how anyone could possibly look at that yeah. and, and, and think otherwise. And, and I just want to linger on that for a second. But that's why my prediction to you is that once the ideology falls into ill repute or disrepute, what you'll see is epic gaslighting. And you're starting to see it now, yeah. which is also why I see it. Since I never believe that. This is not, nobody wants to defund the police. There's an article in the New York Times, yes, we really do mean abolish the police. And the same people are saying, well, so I, I think that there's going to be... Why I did maybe disagree with you on this yeah, is that sure. in Britain, I think we're, we're past peak trans ideology yeah. uh, and, and the madness of it. And again, I'm, I have agreed with everything you said. I'm... I would never you can identify as anti-trans. Sure. I'd say yeah, I'm yeah. pro-woman and also pro-protecting children. Right. Right. But in, in, at the ballot box, for example, and this we had this in Scotland, Nicola Sturgeon had to leave uh, the uh, leadership of the Scottish, uh, Scottish National Party yeah, yeah. Uh, because she was unable to answer the question, what is a woman? People see that and they go, are you insane? Even the leader of the opposition in England, in Britain, sorry, Keir Starmer, says that 99.9% yeah. of of, of women don't have a penis as in one in a thousand do right. so and, and people see that and you go insane and it's, it's unpopular right. with the ballot box but here in this country I see someone like Dylan Mulvaney and there's I don't see the same backlash I, for here I don't see people I, I see certainly conservatives and I see uh, women's rights activists digging in their heels and, and upset about it but I don't see ideas being changed it just seems that people are just doubling down in their own little silos yeah, it's difficult. I can't. I can't say. I just Reed and I just came back from Australia, and we we had some pretty interesting meetings, and we met with deans and heads of think tanks and reporters. And as we walked out of that meeting, the thing that I said to myself was I, that I said to myself was, "Wow, these just like." They're ex almost exactly a year behind. Just, they're just waiting until it comes from mm -hmm. them. And as I walked out, Reed said that exact same thing to me. He's like, "Wow, well, just give give it a year. Wait a year. They can see. Yeah, yeah. Gonna see it again. So, so I can't. I can't speak. I can say when I've been in Europe, um, that curve is about. And we should probably maybe we want to talk about how woke ideology spreads in non English speaking countries. Yes, but, that's very interesting. How yeah. does it spread in non English? Because it's starting to happen now in Europe. It's been very much the preserve of the Anglosphere for a while. And I'm starting to see it in France as a pushback. And it's, and I think it's because gender uh, self-ID is coming into place. And that seems to me to be the back door that woke uh, ideology is coming into, into non-English speaking Europe. Would you agree with that? Or um, Okay, so... So and, and Macron is doing some interesting stuff with that, um, mm -hmm. and I. But although I have to say I don't like his recent posture, pro China and, and against the United States, that our, our old venerable friendship. So, okay. So I published a piece in November eighth in the Spectator about this. So so this is kind of it took me a long time to think about this. When I was in Austria, I gave a talk with lawyers, and I said this is coming in six months, and basically everybody laughed at me. And then I went back in six months and the same guy, one of the guys who laughed at me came, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So let's talk about how wokeness spreads. So for wokeness to work, it needs one thing. It needs a double meaning of a word. It means that, that means that one woke word has to have two meanings. It has to have the meaning in common parlance and it has to have the woke meaning. So this is referred to as the Mott. We spoke about this briefly, the Mott and the Bailey. The Bailey is the way that woke people use the words. The Mott is the way that normal people use the words, like equity. Inclusion is a good one. Inclu we want everybody, of course you want people to be included. And so wh what happens is in, like when I was in Hungary or um, Austria or basically any place, any any place outside the Anglosphere. And that includes India as well. When you translate a woke word into another language, the only thing that translates is the mot, is the primary meaning of the word. The secondary meaning of the word doesn't, it can't translate, it doesn't translate. So the consequence of that is that in order for woke to infect a system and spread throughout the system, it has to be an English word. Uh, so interesting. So, what? So, which words are then heading hitting the continent? The same words that we use in English: oh, diversity, right. equity, inclusion, blank. The whole list. Wow. The whole so thing. They use the English word. They use English words. Now, woke can work in any language, but English is the language of woke, and so 
you you can't like if you did that in German or Hungarian or what have you, it just wouldn't it people it wouldn't make any sense. And then when it made it into public policy documents, people would say, well, look, we know the definition of the word. What are you talking about? But when it makes it into a public policy definition in the Anglosphere, then the woke people go to the Bailey. They go to the woke definition of the word, and it's too late at that point because it's already in public policy. That's so interesting. Yeah, there's uh, perhaps zooming out a little bit, but back to the the idea of woke you before we started recording you talked about sort of you gave me the impression you sort of given up and engaging in conversation with the woke which is striking given that you've written a whole book right. about how to engage and and dig into the epistemology of woke thought and and uh, and and how to have positive conversations indeed the book is called how to have constructive conversations right. um and yet you have seemed to have given up. Have you given up? Okay, no, no. So let, 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 let me clarify. This is really important. So we're talking about, by and large, a group of people who believe that dialogue and discourse are inherently not only racist in and of themselves, but they it's called privilege-preserving epistemic pushback. The person who is engaged in the dialogue, it is just a way, they're only engaged in the dialogue as a way to maintain power. And if you're a woke person, I don't want to give that point for, you know, platforming, a non-consensual cold platforming. I don't want to engage that person to amplify their voice to hurt marginalized people. Mm. So it is a choice they themselves have made to not engage their people with whom they have some ideological disagreement. But the consequence of that ultimately is that it's a mimetic device to prevent the ideology from any kind of penetration from an anything that could dislodge the ideology or could decrease the confidence that any of the propositions in the suite of beliefs that the ideology holds is true. So it's not that I won't engage. It's that any time that the, those, there are any, and they're not even engagements, they're just kind of ad hominem attacks. Mm. That's so interesting because one of the things I found having read your book, I read it a yeah. few years ago, is actually unless both parties read the book. Right. It, only one of them, one of you read the book. It's very hard to, you need to get both people to cu approach the conversation in that way. So are you leaving, are you sort of, is there a follow-up where it's like, <laughs> the conversation's over? Yeah, so that's the thing about an impossible conversation. In a conversation, an impossible conversation, you, you can have a conversation with someone who has a radically different metaphysical belief about, you know, angels and all this, or whatever, a radically different political belief. It doesn't matter what it is. When I taught in prisons, the, the concern was never that people would disagree with me or, you know, say, you know, screw you with the middle finger. The concern was always that they wouldn't say anything. Because if they don't say anything, there's nothing to hook on to. There's no conversation. So, you know, you, if someone doesn't want to have a conversation with you, you can't kidnap them, put them in your trunk and beat them until they want to talk to you. That's a literally impossible conversation. So the conversation is impossible if no one wants to have a conversation with you. Mm, okay, let's see. Can uh, also zooming out again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me. So, as a, a prominent new atheist thinker, yeah. writer, yeah, yeah. and speaker, I wondered if you uh, might see a link between. Did, did the new atheists clear the? We've talked about trans. We've talked about yeah, yeah. woke. I would throw in environmentalism, and that's one of these new quasi pseudo religions. Michael Schellenberg, Bjorn Lundberg, talk about that. It's Absolutely. Yep. Do you think I would? It would be unfair for me to say that the new atheists perhaps cleared a path by killing God yes. again yeah. <laughs> um, for these new religions to, these new quasi-religions, pseudo-religions yes. to flourish. Is 100%. There, is, there, is there a link? It's absolutely true. And I think there was a Pollyanna attitude that many new atheists had that so somehow will will bury God, borrow a turn of phrase from Nietzsche, and everybody's going to be living in some rational paradise. Little did anybody know at that point, although the canaries in the coal mine were in the new atheist movement, the skeptical movement, we started to see this in the very beginning, that what would replace it would be horrific. I mean, it would just be, I mean, look, 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 look with the kind of things that we're dealing with now. And so the, it's called the substitution hypothesis. I can never remember if I came up with this or Peterson or my partner. I don't really remember where this comes from. But the idea is that it's a substitution hypothesis. So what, it's like Game of Thrones. You know, you only you ever watch Game of Thrones? No. You're kidding me. I, uh, 
If this is a recommendation, I'll... I'll yeah, <laughs> wow, that's just amazing to me. You should begin immediately. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, you, the only reason that you have new gods is because people don't believe in the old gods anymore, mm -hmm. right? So the, so the substitution hypothesis is when you get rid of the Abrahamic traditions or whatever is traditional religion in a, in a country, something else will come in, sub, some other form of irrationality or will come in and, and substitute for what was lost because the default is you just have to believe in something. Rationality or, or uh, religion it doesn't have to be irrational, does it? Or another worldview? No, it would have to be. View, it, it would ha well, it would have to be a worldview that wasn't substantiated by the evidence because that's what substitutes it. Uh -huh. Okay, so with if, if you're fighting now, not just as you were fighting in the universities, you're fighting across the world to defeat these new pseudo religions what are you going to replace them with oh that that's a, that that's the a, a great question the first thing you have to do is you have to replace them with the institutions that have been corrupted right so you have to replace them with the university of austin's for example that's that, that's that's brick and mortar so to speak the, wh what about the oh, ideas okay themselves? okay so let's let's take let's take a hierarchical look at this there's theory institutions downstream of that is belief, right? So there's the theory. I'm talking about the beliefs. I want to understand that. Right. So so the way that people get the belief is from the theory through the institutions, then they start believing it. So if you change the institutional structures, if you change the way that the academies are function and running downstream of that, that's why there's a, there's a woke contagion. The woke contagion started in, um, it's well, it actually starts in K through 12, but the way that you teach in K through 12 is you go through a college of education. College of education are predicated not upon seeking truth, but alleviating oppression. That's a ubiquitous phenomenon at every ed, ed school in the country. Okay, so the way that you change the beliefs at the bottom, there are two ways. One is street epistemology. There are, there, there are actually three or four ways, but but one is street epistemology, what what we do in our video and our... our Let me our quickly explain station. what that is. Because I've seen the videos, but... Yeah, so street epistemology is a way to... It's a non-confrontational, -confront uh, non-adversarial way to have better conversations to help people and yourself reflect upon the confidence in your beliefs and whether that confidence is warranted by the reason and evidence you have for believing it. So you're going out on the street... Yeah, all over the world. Random strangers together. To uh, never, no awesome. actors, 100% random people, strangers everywhere. We just got back from, Reed and I just got back from Australia. We just got back from Florida. We just got back from Puerto Rico. We're going to go to your island next. And what what we do is we just put tape on the ground from strongly disagree, disagree, slightly disagree, neutral to the strongly agree. We ask people what they want to talk about, and we take epistemology, what it is, how you know what you know, out of the universities, and we bring it to the streets. And we give people tools that they can use to not only have civil conversations, but to figure out if they're warranted or justified in the confidence of, the, of their beliefs. We just did a really interesting one the other day with a young girl. We don't usually, we never do people under 18 because you need parental permission to view but her mom was there and the claim was Miley Cyrus was the best singer ever I never really I mean I heard in the Miley Cyrus I couldn't tell you I listened to Tool and Heavy Metal I couldn't tell you one song Miley Cyrus sang. you know who Miley Cyrus is I, I, I'm a great admirer of her music and, yeah. uh, and she's a great talent in uh, okay, well, many I know, apartments I know nothing about her like Wrecking Ball you know Wrecking Ball it's a great song I listen to Heavy Metal I don't know any of this we'll stuff have a little Okay. Rock and roll session later, okay. Miley session. Well, I don't know if that. I don't know if I know you well enough to, <laughs> to want that. But uh, did I do something wrong? I don't know. No, no, no. Just on my side. But so, so she, you know, her her claim was Miley Cyrus is the best, and she stood on the strongly agree. Um, but after only a few questions in a few minutes, you know, she went to the agree, just targeted Socratic questions to help her think, to help her give her a tool. And I told her mom, it's like you can do this with her with anybody. You can do this at work. So. Anyway, so the one one of the ways downstream, what replaces it is you give people tools so that they can lead a better life. And this is a way that the word community is actually applicable. They can help their communities. Sorry. That's, that's wonderful. And actually, it's particularly effective seeing as you're filming it so people can watch it. And, it, and it's... It, and it's free. And, yeah, and it's free. But you know, I think my question sort of... I, Without being sort of too rude, no, I think be, it's don't great worry. Thing to do, say but anything you want to me. So how Believe do, me, we're getting rid of a pseudo religion. Yeah. The, and the the 
I don't know, I don't quite see street ep epistemology great as it is. I can't see how that's going to be a new... And it's not, it's not. The, no, 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 it's not. Okay, so, so the older I get here, if I can tell you one conclusion I've come up with in the 56 years of my life, going on 57, it's that the best way to make a positive change isn't e either in the way people believe things or in the way societies ebb and flow, it's through values. And so what people value matters. <clears throat> and if you believe that certain things, as I believe, and I, my guess is that you believe, and as we explore our friendship, I'll come to, over time to figure out if you actually do believe this, is that certain val cer you can value certain things to lead you to a good life and you can value certain things to lead your community to flourish. And if once you admit that, then you can, you have to admit by necessity, certain things you can value lead against your own well being and that of your communities. And so we ha have to give people tool sets to enable them to value the right things. But even before you do that, you have to think about that structure, theory, institutions, people. Right now, what's happening is the reason that people's- You said beliefs earlier instead of people. Well, pe what pe people and what they believe. So you, they have the theory, the theory informs the institutions in K through 12 and colleges of education. The people in those academic, in that academic milieu, think of the academy as an ideology mill where they want to replicate this ideology and then they teach that to students. The first order of business is to shut shut that replication process. Where, how this idea makes sense to me is, in fact, as I see it, is almost that's how the critical theory has managed to come Correct. and attack those greater beliefs we have. But really, in essence, it's it's built the other way. Those great institutions didn't come from theory institutions and they came the other way around where it's belief, then we build institutions and then theory on top of that. That's how it was constructed. So right. if we're, we're dealing with the belief itself, I can see how that's a good way to, uh, to attack the new beliefs, the new religions right. is, is the same ah. tactic. But I'm talking about the, the beliefs themselves at the core. If we're going to eventually defeat these uh, ideas that we dislike, uh, which, as I've now said a few times, are new religions. Right. What, what's okay. the new religion to replace them? Okay, so this is extremely important. Okay, so the difference is at some level in a religious architecture, at some level, at least in the Christian tradition, the Islamic tradition this isn't the case, you need some kind of a faith-based belief. You need some kind of a, of a way. If, 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 you're in, if you have, you know, if you believe that you have eight confidence in something or even nine, if you believe that you have eight evidence on a scale from one to 10, but your confidence is nine, you, there's a difference between the confident, the evidence you have and the confidence you have. That slack is usually called faith. Like it's made up by something. But in the new religion, critical social justice, wokeism, whatever you want to call you, whatever you want to call it, ultimately you have bodies of peer-reviewed literature, which are corrupt, we've just discussed that, that they can point to so they don't need any faith. Like ultimately someone who's versed in this can point to it and then it percolates throughout. So it's not, so there has to be some prophylactics in place to prevent people from believing other deranged things, right? So I don't know what's going to come after wokeism. I have a, a, a very strong suspicion about what the next culture war will be about. And the next culture war will be about whether or not, and people who are ordinarily strong bedfellows like Christians and athe atheists weren't, but now they are. Most of my supporters are actually Christians. But the next uh, culture war I predict will be those who want to save legacy institutions and those who want to destroy them. Steven Pinker wants to save them. I want to destroy them. Mm. So that will be the next culture war. So it's not like it's the substitution. That sounds like it's an intra-culture war. That's a, a war amongst the people who agree with this ideology, some of these certain ideologies. We've been calling them woke, going too far, right? That's not the, a culture war to replace, let's say, the trans-culture war, because that's this is within the anti-woke community. No, no, <laughs> I, I think, call it community. I think, I think that these... I could be totally wrong about this. I would be completely wrong. I think we'll, this whole thing is going to, it's just so idiotic. I just cannot believe it's, it's sustainable. 
I, I, I'm amazed that it's gone this far. But I don't see this being around in 10 years. I see it being replaced by, and of course, you know, a few nukes in American cities could change everything immediately, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is part of the other problem. You know, I, I try never to even mention Dylan Mulvaney. I don't even like the fact that I mentioned it or... Sorry, I brought him up. No, 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 that's fine. But the, the, the problem is then that that is a failure, the obsession with drag shows, et cetera. It's a failure to morally triage or even socially and politically triage the problems. We have like I, Portland, Oregon. Portland, Oregon is becoming a huge cesspool. Homelessness, drug addiction, uh, crime. On a national level, we have inflation. We have problems to Ukraine war. We should simply not be talking about Dylan Mulvaney. It's, it, it's insane. Mm -hmm. You know, as Douglas Murray, our mutual friend says, it, it's like... It, you know, p people are trying to sneak nukes in and everybody's worried about everybody's pronouns. But I, I think that, that it's not that one religion will replace another religion. It's that if people value certain things that will lead their community to flourishing. And these are not particularly difficult things. In fact, I would argue they're all rationally drivable. Compassion, basic human decency, civility. If you don't like a statue, that's fine. You petition through democratic process to have the statue removed. There's no like thug rule where if you don't like a deer in Portland, they've ripped down, you know, they ripped down the Abraham Lincoln statue. You, you said earlier in this conversation that it's all about narrative and all of right. these ideas have a narrative. And there's, there's truth to that. We all function with a narrative. We right. have our, as individuals our own narrative. And that greater narrative, science can't fill that. Right, that new narrative. We need a. Um, I, now again, I would say it's a metaphysic on which to build build it all. And, uh, and okay, so, so I'm hammering perhaps okay, too, so too much the same point. No, no, no. So if you have a metaphysic, and and so, you, so let, let's say that one's metaphysic is they believe that there's some kind of a supernatural realm populated by all these entities, or they believe that throughout in the time space continuum there are certain points that that a godhead or some kind of div divine being came in and intervened and somebody walked on water or, you know, bread and loaves, wine, water, or what, whatever it is, healed people, whatever it is. Those, those phenomenon, those phenomena are usually grounding for the value system. Mm -hmm. In other words, if you don't have those, then you can't have the value system. Mm -hmm. And I'm telling you in no uncertain terms, that is simply not true. Okay, well, so tell me, because that's exactly the argument I'm making. What, how is that not true? <clears throat> so if it is the case, so let's say, so, so you have, so, so there are two possibilities, right? There's a possibility that, 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 and, that, and let's say we don't know what universe we're living in, right? There's a possibility where, a creator intervened in the space-time continuum and did these things that are we term miracles. And let's say that you don't know if you're in that universe or you're not in that universe. My question to you is, would the values still hold? And I would say to you that the values, independent of the universe in which you knew you were in, the values, many of those values would still hold. How you treat people, treating people with kindness, being a decent human being. Why would those values still hold? Well, because you can figure them out. You can derive them, which is why they've held in the beginning. They didn't hold. Of course, the metaphysic helped, you know, at least people believing that there was. So so if, if people believe that someone walked on water, they're far more likely to believe his pronouncements than if they believe he didn't walk on water. Mm -hmm. So the metaphysics is, in a sense, a way to concretize and sustain a value throughout a long period of time. But you can have the same value independent of whether or not someone walked on water. You can have it independently, but it would it could just as well be coincidental that you have it independently. And there's no reason why you you can't argue against that value. So it could be, but it, I mean, it certainly could be. But then again, you could reason to certain values. I mean, look in a judicial system, right? For which, example, by the way, sorry, go on. No, no, go ahead. Well, you can reason to certain values, yeah. which is exactly why whenever metaphysic has been removed from a society or a civilization, the those morals completely get twisted and. 100 percent hell breaks loose. yeah no that that's correct that's uh, that's not an argument that the the metaphysic is true that's an argument that it has socially detrimental effects that's a big difference sure 
So, but doesn't that argue against the idea that that, that more you could still have those morals that you you would still have those morals? Because I would say no, not necessarily. You wouldn't necessarily have the same values. Sorry to use your word. Yeah, yeah. If, or you can say morals too. You, you interchangeable. Might, you might be. Some of them might be interchangeable and, and, and come in me, but I wouldn't say that they are uh, obvious. That, that those morals will not. Uh, one, I don't think one can assume one would have the same morals. Yeah, no, you're right. Values. You're certainly right. You, you, you can assume that you'd have the same morals, but equally likely, why should you? I mean, you, you, you. There is something I find disturbing about believing things that are almost definitely false, so that the society will function more smoothly. I'm not unsympathetic. I guess, you know, if my kids were butchered by a, a lunatic, uh, would I much rather have that lunatic believe in some kind of metaphysic that, you know, a, a perpetual fear of hell so that he didn't do something deranged and I'd still have my kids? Well, yeah, I would. I would. So so I think maybe my, my to borrow a term, my situatedness, um, d or may, maybe as Henderson says, that's just a luxury belief I have. I don't know. But there is something... I, I just don't think you can compromise yourself like that. I just I just don't I think to maintain your integrity, you, you have to believe true things in every realm. Like you can't just say, well, you know, metaphysics, you know, I'm just gonna No, I it just I just think that that, that, that says something pernicious to an individual's integrity. Uh well, I'll I'll uh I'll have to um Mull on that. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair enough. <laughs> um, but I would concede that there's an element of, uh, absolutely, an element of faith. And I liked your term earlier, that, that, that you know, the notch, like the, the eight to the nine. And, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with that. Um, but um, on a positive note, yeah, yeah. if I may. Oh, I thought that was a positive note, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Not to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, can you tell me about your uh, not-for-profit that you've been working on? Yeah, uh, National Progress Alliance, mm -hmm. and we f are a small nonprofit, and we promote free speech and civil discourse, and fight woke ideology and all of its manifestations. Which are which is the one thing at this moment that is really preventing us from seeing more civil a more civil and just society. So that's what we do. Great. And a how, small how, team, two full-time employees and a bunch of part-time employees. Wonderful. And how can and people f find out about it? And, and National Progress Alliance and everything. We're 100% donor funded. So we do all of the YouTube videos. We That's, you know, it pays for stuff. Mm. We, we go, Reed and I go around the world. Reed's a volunteer. We go around the world. We make videos. We give talks. We teach people how to have productive conversations. We teach institutions how to keep wokeism out, how to, you know, avoid this madness from in infecting their societies. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big job. It's so wonderful to see that after the the hellish experience you had in Portland yeah. State University, that you've, you, you really like a plane taking off into the wind. It, it's just now your reach is global, and and you're really putting everything into. Before you were trying to destroy these ideas in the universe or question them right now you're doing it on a, on, on the world stage and and that's and that's very inspiring i'm sure a lot of people oh, I, watching I get, you I, I appreciate that i mean i can't do this alone i have a lot of people who help me and so you know this is how like it's this is not a one person thing you, you really need a community to borrow that turn of phrase but you actually do need people and you know we're donor supported i have an incredibly dedicated staff and we this is just what we do full time and i'm incredibly grateful to be able to do that well my more power to yeah you. thanks my dad used to tell me make sure you leave the world better when you left than when you got in and i think that's what we're trying to do wonderful stuff well peter boghosian thank you so much for your time thank you I fascinating appreciate it thank you thank you